Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Christian Democracy, where we talk about Catholic social teaching in the light of contemporary affairs. My name is Jack Quirk, and we begin by praying, Father, let us be the hands that bring food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, healing to the sick, comfort to the prisoners, and welcome to the strangers. May everything that is said here be in furtherance of these things, and of your truth, and of your love, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And like I say, this is Christian democracy, and uh, in furtherance of the types of things that we were just ta- praying about there, we have a very special guest here this evening, uh, Rebecca Bratton Weiss, who is the co-founder of the new pro-life movement uh, and has uh, many other things on her resume. Uh, we will be talking about those as we go along. She's also the uh, uh, head of uh, Patheos Catholic, where a number of Catholics, including myself, get together and and uh, do that, uh, write blogs, uh, Christian Democracy, of course, being the blog that I write. And uh, she has her own uh, blog on there, Suspended in Her Jar. Isn't that right, uh, Rebecca? Yes, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, Rebecca, we, we're not on, uh, we have to do this over the phone because of a technological glitch. Uh, I didn't see any strange appearances in the sky, and my lights aren't out, but uh, perhaps there's an eclipse somewhere. Uh, this has to be in a, uh, uh, this has to be recorded because apparently the transmitter is out, and uh, the Skype wasn't working. So we're just talking to each other on the phone. <laughs> This is uh, this is my magical ability to cause tech problems everywhere I go. Um, it's, oh, it's you do like this. some kind I of a it. curse. I I think I think that I must. Yes, I think it's some kind of a luddite thing. Um, like uh, I have a luddite aura, and it just it just kills technology everywhere around it? me. I get it. Well, <laughs> you know, no, no, I, I I have I have a similar effect on people, except in my case, they bang their heads. <laughs> I think well, we uh, we share this effect. Okay. Well, anyway, what's uh, anyway? If you've uh, read any of uh, Doctor Weiss's stuff, you uh, will find that uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it takes a while. You have to really put your mind to it. It's not it's not easy stuff. But uh, but when you when you get to the new pro life movement, you know, first of all, I just got to ask you, new pro life movement. What, what was wrong with the old one, eh? You know? <laughs> Oh, you know, it's funny. Um, I've said before I never meant to start a pro-life group. I really didn't. It was not on my list of things to do. But it was back in 2016 when the, uh, of course, the presidential elections were going on and we were waiting to see who's going to become the Republican nominee. Not that I was planning on voting for a Republican, um, but I was waiting to see who the Republicans were going to vote for and surrounded as I am by Catholics, it was really uh, constantly reiterated that this was an issue that was important because of abortion and because of the pro-life movement. And when it seemed clear to us that Donald Trump was edging in as a forerunner, we were like, whoa, you know, this is, this isn't going to work y'all. This, this isn't going to be a pro-life thing to do. At, at what point are you going to realize that? And I kept waiting for people to say, "No, this is this is not a pro-life uh, choice. This is not a pro-life person. This will not be a pro-life president." And no one was saying it. And various pro-life leaders and spokespersons were kind of flocking to his side. And I think it may have been Mark Shea, who was just on your show, who said something like, "We." We need a new pro-life movement, and so my friend Matthew was, Tyson was, was, and I. Was the carpet bombing he was thinking about that maybe gave you that idea, or what? Yeah. 
Oh, maybe that, you know, sexual oh, that assault, the racism. Um, yeah, the cruise was the carpet bombing. I mean, I'd been saying for a while that the Republican Party was not a particular pro-life option, but I could still see why people would make the argument that it was. It was, you know, kind of a, a let's agree to disagree type scenario. But then, yeah, so... Um, so Matthew and I started messaging each other, and we're like, yeah, we probably really should start a That's new Matthew pro-life Tyson. movement. That's Matthew That's Tyson. That's Matthew Tyson, yeah, my co-founder. Yeah. yeah. yeah one day i got to have him on the show, but, it, it, you know, I, I always am an inch away, just to let you know my cultural level, I'm always an inch away from calling him Mike. But it's, oh. it's, <laughs> right. it's just, Yeah, you should get him on the show. He's great. Um, And he was running yeah. for office recently, so I yeah. – um, I understand that. I told yeah. I told him I'd never run for office because if uh, I only get one vote, then I'll know my wife didn't vote for me. Say so. <laughs> but he he uh, he did it uh, pretty well. But it, but it, you know he, he so I admire his bravery there. So he decided you and Mike got together. And I did it. You and Matthew <laughs> got together and uh, and um, yeah, and, we just, uh, just kind started of, this thing. Yeah, it just kind of grew. We just started a Facebook page. And it was it was really it wasn't so much us it was just that everyone wanted this so many people in which it arises who believe that abortion is a material moral tragedy were also you know horrified by all of these other moral tragedies and saying you know how can we only look at one without looking at all of the others how can we only look at this one and and simply try to make it illegal without looking at the complex situation in which it arises and without looking at all of these vast other numbers of of life issues so it was really more like um it just kind of sprouted up (laughs) and um even even a number of my pro-choice friends have gotten on board with this. And this, of course, is one of the things that um, other pro-lifers like to attack us for because if... Well, that's um, interesting. What, what, why would a pro-choice put in what you're doing? Uh, because many pro-choice people don't like abortion either. Uh, they think that it's painful, tragic. Um, they think that it's a, the last choice a woman would want to make. And they think that we need to have a culture in which the reasons why women choose abortions uh, are eliminated. And so so we're working towards that end with a huge emphasis on uh, gender equality, on women's rights as well. And so uh, I think we've found a lot of common ground. You know, you could take kind of um, on nine out of ten issues I will agree with one of my fellow pro-choice, one of my fellow feminists who happens to be pro-choice. I just happen to be pro-life. Whereas if I talk to a kind of mainstream, what we might say, old pro-life movement type person, we will agree on maybe one and then disagree on the other nine. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where yeah, we well, stand. That, that, that's an interesting thing. Well, for, well, first of all, you you just said a fellow feminist. You're a feminist and uh, pro life. Wait a minute, is that how does that work? <laughs> oh yes, feminist very much so. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. That, that, well, that's possible. Yeah, and there is. I mean, there's a whole uh, group of uh, feminists for life. You're probably familiar with them. Um, and there are other pro life groups that identify as feminists, such as New Wave feminists. Um, and Destiny Herndon De La Rosa has been uh, fairly prominent as a spokesperson who identifies as both pro-life and a feminist. I think that our group may be unique in that we view the actions of many pro-choice feminists as morally motivated. I don't see most pro-choice feminists as being, you know, as I say, feminazis. I don't see them as fake feminists. Um, you know, Rush but, Limbaugh came up with that word, yes. feminazis. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah, okay. oh. Right, right. oh, gosh, I, I used to listen to Rush it. back in the day. Oh, yeah, I was a Rush fan. Oh, You were? Oh, was, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I was brought up to be a good conservative. 
look what happened. Um, so yeah, yeah, pro-life feminism. I mean, if if feminism is the the belief in uh, a need for social engagement with issues of injustice towards women, there's absolutely no reason why you can't also be pro-life. Um, I think that it's more a matter of how you go about being pro-life. One way you you shouldn't go about it is by saying, oh, well, we're going to make abortion illegal and we're also going to elect this guy who's bragged publicly about sexual assault. That's that's not going to work out very well. Well, it has a t- people have a tendency, whether it's logically uh, valid or not, to have a tendency to associate one set one idea in, within a set of ideas with another. So, you know, right. you're going to say, I'm for right. life and I'm for you know, a guy who does that, well, then you, you, <laughs> pro-life must mean that, uh, well, you're like Donald Trump, which, right. which some people are going around saying he's the most uh, pro-life president in history. Yeah. Which is, you know, so that, he's a, you know, wh- whatever he is, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, he, it's, uh, it's, there's a, now, I, I'm looking at uh, like a handout of yours or something, and you say, who are we? And that's the question we all ask, isn't it? But you're saying, who are we? NPLM, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> not, I, I can ask that as an existential question yeah, okay. later after a few yeah. drinks. We can have well, that, well, that yeah. debate. Well, it's, fun, it's, fun to, uh, it's, it's fun to ask people who are you and then, you know, really cross-examine them on it. But that's another oh, yeah. time. Okay. Yeah. We, really, we believe that all life has intrinsic worth and that human life has a claim on our protection from conception to natural death. Now, by all yeah. life, you, of course, mean American life, right? I mean all life. Oh I mean goodness. amoebas. Mean, I mean grass. You mean, you mean uh, people from, you mean, you mean immigrants? <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean immigrants. I mean uh, people who don't look like us or speak like us. Uh, I mean non-Americans. I mean, non-humans, if there is extraterrestrial life, I think that it also has intrinsic worth. Um, And I think, yeah, I mean, uh, Matthew Tyson, my co-founder, for instance, is a vegetarian because of his pro-life beliefs. Uh, I'm moving in that direction. I will only eat meat that's been ethically harvested. I won't eat factory farmed meat. Uh, The day may come when I don't eat meat at all, but it tastes good. Um, but I feel yeah, like this I, I, is one of those issues where... I, go ahead. <laughs> I've got, no, I was going to say, I've gone a certain distance with you there. I now yes. understand that it's important not to eat animals alive. But yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I, I do that, and I and uh, I sworn off cannibalism. But other than that, I'm, I'm way behind you. But I, but I do... Uh, I, I do understand the logic behind it because, honest to goodness, uh, you know, and you you would you would know more about whether or not uh, cows and such are conscious, but they seem to be mm-hmm. on some level. But oh yeah, know, it, but it's uh, I, uh, yeah, I I I I see the logic, I understand it, but I'm weak, Rebecca. I'm weak. Yeah, me too. I mean, and that's one reason why I'm able to be um, very open to finding common ground with pro-choice people because if I'm sitting here kind of quietly thinking maybe I shouldn't be killing animals to eat them, but I'm doing it anyway, then I need to be patient with people who are, um, I guess, seeing some gray area for wiggle room and moral decisions for women who find themselves in, in, in dire circumstances. But in any event, you, uh, you do believe that, uh, uh, along with reality, that, that uh, human life begins from the moment of fertilization, no? Oh, and yeah. And goes all yeah. the way to natural death. So yeah. therefore, you know, that's, yeah. that's the essential ground. Now, you say here we oppose all violence, injustice, and coercion. Well, you know, I don't know about injustice, but if you get rid of all violence and coercion, you're getting rid of all government, aren't you? Isn't government violence and coercion? It certainly sometimes tends to be. Um, but I feel like we... 
uh, part of our American heritage is this very, it's odd because we created a government of the people and then immediately started being like, oh, government, scary. Um, Mm -hmm. And obviously government can become institutionalized and kind of take on a, an identity and a kind of mindless organic power of its own. But as a socialist, oh, I tend to think of government much more as being something oh, which is supposed to represent the choices of the people. And uh, as long as it does so, it's not violent and it's not coercive. I mean, I was just uh, visiting my sister in London, and I'm always so struck when I visit there by how beautiful everything is and it's beautiful because they have very strict laws about building, about trash disposal, about um, maintaining property but the people like it like that because they're proud of their land and the beauty of their gardens and their historic structures so the laws that uh, prevent them from just, you know, like trashing everything <laughs> the way they do here in Ohio where I live. These are laws that people want, that, that people chose because they understand that it's going to make their life more beautiful. So, um, you know, even their dump, the dump I visited in London where we just took our, our recycling and things, it was so well organized. I was like, you know, we need some socialist dumps in the United States. So, no, I don't think government has to be violent. But obviously, we're looking at a situation right now where we do have an authoritarian and violent uh, group of people in power. Or or if somebody robs a a bank or breaks into a house, you've got to have violence then, right? I mean, some, some of these guys, you won't talk them out of it, will you? Well, I mean, is that violent or is that simply a, a barrier that you're putting up to stop someone? You know, like um, barriers they're running directly into. I yes, they it's do. All, <laughs> <laughs> it's all it, it's all nomenclature, you know. You see what I mean? It's these, right. These word games here. But anyway, listen. Yeah. I, uh, but but you said uh, the S word a moment ago. You know what I mean? I by did. The S word. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's a socialist. Oh. Okay. Okay. You, you said the socialist work. <laughs> no. <I mean. laughs> no. Yeah, I'm just like, like letting that. all my evil flags fly here. I'm a feminist and <laughs> socialist. <laughs> so the yes. So the uh, you said you said socialist and you identified yourself as one. My yeah. goodness, Doctor Weiss. Listen, <laughs> I want to ask you. <laughs> I want to ask you about this now. See, okay, you got to explain, okay. you got to explain, you got to explain something this to me, okay? Because I and okay. this is something. I, this is not a prepared thing. This is something I really need to know, okay? For okay. those of us like myself who were uh, born about the same time as Karl Marx, mm-hmm. okay? <laughs> if you know, really, we and I grew up together. Um, you know, the the thing is, is we remember, you know, having to get underneath our desks because, oh, yeah. you know, the Russians, you know, were practicing for when the Russians send their missiles over and and all of that. And, you know, we heard about all the thing, you know, the, what was it, uh, no, there, there was some plan that uh, Chairman Mao was doing, ended up killing mm-hmm. a bunch of people. There was Pol Pot. And heck, there's even still North Korea today. And when we hear socialist, we go, oh, my goodness. And then I see all these people, you know, young folks, intellectuals usually saying that they're socialists. And I say, what are you, why are you calling yourself that, for heaven's sakes? <laughs> you know. It's like, well, we're not that kind of socialist. And honestly, to me, I mean, it's like saying, okay, somebody comes from, you know, based on my experience, someone comes along and says, you know, well, we're, we're Nazis. What do you mean you're Nazis? Well, we're not that kind, you know. So, <laughs> what? Okay. So, okay, yeah. So, so, um. so, so, so I just, what, um, now, I, no, no, I, I read your stuff. I know who you are. I'm familiar with your online presence. I know you're not a bad person. <laughs> uh, you know, but you say you're a socialist. What exactly is a socialist when you say that you are one? Uh, I believe that the means of produ- production and capital should belong to the workers. Um, that's kind of the essence of socialism and a uh, a radical economic egalitarianism that we have a social responsibility 
to give out of our wealth and our privilege to those who do not have as much. Now, um, I am delighted that I've apparently exuded youthfulness so that it's not obvious that I too remember the days of um, having to hide under our desks. So I was homeschooled, so we didn't have the same kind of desks. But yeah, I remember like our great fear was that Russia was going to nuke us. And I vividly remember when the Soviet Union um, kind of disintegrated and it was like, whoa, this thing that, that I grew up fearing, it, it went away. Um, when I was 13, I read the Communist Manifesto just because I was trying to be rebellious. You're a typical 13-year-old, right? Right. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, I was like, they told me this bad, so I'm going to read this bad thing. And I, I don't know what I was expecting to find all of this, like, really violent craziness. And instead it was, I was so disappointed because it seemed moral and it made sense. <laughs> and I was looking for, for something rebellious. So um, I haven't, I haven't read it for a long time since then. But I you would know, say... You know, that's, well, I'm sorry. I, I am, uh, we're on the phone here and I'm terrible about interrupting. Please continue. Oh, Tell yeah. me to shut up when I do that. No, because, no, not uh, at all. Oh, you're, you're saving me the difficult... When you talk, I don't have to think of, of like clever things to say. You can say the mm. clever things instead. Well, see, I talk <laughs> without really thinking about anything, so we need to, you know, help each other out here. So go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, but, yeah, when when people make this kind of, like, Nazis on far right, socialists on far left comparison, I think that's inaccurate because... Um, yes, I'm not going to deny that communist regimes have done horrible things. I will say this, though, is that in most of the cases where communist regimes did horrible things, these were nations which already had a very serious, um, serious cultural problems, post-colonial issues with a history of radical abuse. So when, you, when the workers finally rise up, they're rising up in an incredible rage against these people who have just abused them. Oh, if you look at, at Latin American countries in which this happened, the legacy of, of imperial colonialism is such that they just destroyed the, the culture of these nations and nothing that grew out of that cultural soil was going to be wholesome. And I would say the same for Russia. Like you read the Russian novels and Dostoevsky portrays this, kind of surreal and violent world. And this is pre-communist Russia. Dostoevsky himself was arrested because he belonged to a pacifist reading group where they discussed Christian socialist ideas. Ooh, so radical. And he was brought before a firing squad and the sentence was like, uh, whatever, what's the word, commuted? The word, you know. Um, Sorry, it's late. My brain doesn't work. In the very last minute, um, they were pardoned by the czar, and a a writer came galloping up to say, no, don't shoot, don't shoot. But you can imagine the terror of these men, like men who had just belonged to a reading group and were going to be shot for it. And I think that that story kind of reminds me that it's not like everything was peachy keen in Russia prior to the Bolshevik Revolution. There was a reason it happened and there was also a reason why it went so badly, because they didn't have a good, um, healthy soil to put roots down into. So there's that, and then there's also just the fact that what uh, socialism is aiming for is, is basically good. It could be done badly. Um, many things can be done badly. Christianity has been done badly. I mean, I'm Jewish in heritage, and... Uh, my own people have been attacked and murdered by Christians repeatedly throughout history. Oh. So the fact that a large group of people have taken an idea and done something horrible with it is not proof that the idea itself is bad. But when it comes to Nazis, the idea itself is bad. It's just a really bad idea because it depends upon extermination. It depends upon white supremacy. So you can take a, a good idea and enact it violently and that's a really bad thing. Or you can take a bad idea and enact it violently. <laughs> oh, and that's what the Nazis did. So 
yeah, there's my, my lengthy spiel on that. No, that was good. That was good. You know, I, I wanted, uh, you know, I, actually, it's making me thinking. One of, the, one of these days, you know, I have to get you back on. Maybe we can get the technology to work that time, and then we can <laughs> talk about this. We could talk about this uh, socialism thing because really, what I wanted to talk to you about was the new pro-life movement. Right. You know? Yeah, but, and but, I'm but better at talking a, about that. <laughs> oh well, you know that's okay. That I, I I'll wait a little while and then you go study up on this, and then I'll yeah. come back and we can talk about it. Okay, because then you'll have to defend it because you know. Right. I'm a, I'm like a I, I'm like a you know. No, no socialism kind of guy, you know. Uh, okay. uh, I'm a, so anyway, so you oppose. Okay, so we want to create a culture that values all life at all stages, and this is right. and then, so this is the foundation for our entire platform. I don't see how anybody could argue with that, but I'll bet you some people would. Oh, they do. If, they if, do. You, if you actually apply <laughs> it, right? You know, it's like yeah. I hope I. Oh no! Wait a minute. Now you sent me this thing, and it won't let me turn the page. Oh Let's, no! What's going on here? Listen, do you have a copy of it there? Well, I see, do. I've got right. a copy you of it are, right in are, front of me. You are a curse yeah. to technology. So go ahead and write <laughs> that. You've got, you've, got ten, you've got ten pillars. Read the first pillar. Okay, yeah. Um, our pillar, do you want me to read the whole thing? Well, sure. Why not? we okay. we got time, don't we? Okay, right, go we got time, yeah. So our first pillar um, pertains to abortion, and it says we oppose the act of abortion and any act that directly and purposefully ends the life of an unborn child. However, we believe the methods of the mainstream pro-life movement have failed to address the issue properly. We believe that the most effective means of reducing and potentially eradicating abortion comes through lessening the demand rather than the supply. This entails greater access to health care, financial assistance, pre- and postnatal care, mandatory paid leave, job protection, equal wages, sexual education, and stronger comprehensive support systems. We support the use of evangelization, science, and philosophy to cultivate a society that recognizes, respects, and cherishes all life at all stages. Okay, well, that, so what that sounds like you're driving at, and, you know, you tell me if you are driving at this, but I'll just tell you what it sounds like to me, okay. and that is that what you, you know, it's one thing to simply proscribe abortion, and, you know, that's, mm-hmm. uh, the catechism tells us that it's got to be proscribed at some point, but it, it uh, but the thing is, is that if you simply proscribe it doesn't, by itself solve the actual problem of abortions right. themselves. In right. fact, you know, you could, uh, especially if you couple your proscription with such things as uh, no more medical care for poor people. Right. I mean, I mean that's, uh, I, I mean, a, a woman facing a situation like that where she doesn't have any money and the cat who fathered her child has now uh, changed his name and moved a few states away. Okay. And and, uh, and uh, she's got no way of of uh, coping with this situation. Well, you know that you know abortion is going to certainly occur to her, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Then, you know, now if I now I could uh, <clears throat> now I could uh, sit here, you know, with uh, maybe I, maybe I get a trust fund or something like that, and I could sit there and say, well, why doesn't she just you know better herself, right? Right. You know, I mean, I, I, I mean, that, that that strikes me sometimes. I, uh, I'll just share with you that sometimes I see people who obviously uh, never worked a day in their lives to get where they are, and they're sitting there right. telling me that you know that well, why doesn't this person just this? You know, oh, I know. Go, like, oh, come on, you know, you, you know, if you had to confront something like that, you'd be blubbering. So don't tell me, you know. It's, but it's totally. Um, yeah, just just you know, lack the lack of ability for some people to put themselves in other people's shoes sometimes gets under my skin. You know what I'm saying? But if what I am, um, but but that seems to be where, what you're driving at. That, yeah, yeah. That oh. uh, that uh, some people just are. You, you don't want you don't want to incentivize abortion by all the rest of your policies if you're going to say you're, you want a pro-life polity. Right. Yeah, and, I mean, abortion has now been legal for 45 years, and people have been doing the same things to try to make it stop, and they're just not working. And that was kind of something that clicked for me years ago 
I was like, wait a minute, why do they keep telling us we have to vote for this guy and abortion's going to end? Because, like, we kept, we've been voting for these guys and some of them have been elected and abortion is still happening. It, it hasn't made any difference. And so I started looking more closely mm-hmm. at, at the methods that were being used and at the rhetoric that was being used. And also I started looking very closely at the the stories and the rhetoric from pro-choice people because having been involved in the pro-life movement since I was a teenager, I was accustomed to thinking of these people as people who support violence, people who support murder. Um, we We need to show them their inconsistency. We need to, um, you know, make a stand and, like, I remember thinking, well, yeah, I just need to show them that, you know, as a woman, I uh, am stronger than that. I'm I'm strong enough to choose life. And I remember, like, being involved in life chain, and I was, I was thinking, I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to stand as a woman who believes in choices and who believes in choosing life. And it didn't occur to me until later that my standing there was really what we just now call virtue signaling. It's like, yay me, um, I'm in this fairly comfortable situation, like feeling smug about myself. That doesn't make any difference. If a woman who was poor and without medical aid were driving past our life chain that day, on her way to Planned Parenthood to look into getting an abortion, my standing there being smug and holding a sign would not make any difference to her at all other than to make her feel worse about the choice that she feels she has to make. So, yeah, I just started kind of um, looking at this. We've been doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results and that's isn't that the definition of insanity is there another way we could go about this that was kind of how my my thinking began uh, i yeah I've, I've always thought of the definition of insanity as like arguing with your with your front door or something but okay if the... no no that's totally normal talking <laughs> to inanimate objects is normal Oh, I, like, well, yeah, but when especially the, when, the when you have my tech problems and and everything's always breaking down. I was going to say, well, when if the when if the door answers back though, that's okay. We're in the realm of Greek mythology then. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, I, that that makes sense. And so you're, uh, you know, let's let's try and do things that work. I get that. Right. You know, and so right. In, in fact, we were just talking last week about how. Mark Shea about how you know actually in his state abortion was legal before Roe versus Wade. Oh yeah, that's you know? right. Yeah, and, and you know, yeah. And, and and the point is, is that you know if you overturn Roe versus Wade, a lot of people don't get this. If you overturn Roe versus Wade, you're going to uh, just create a situation where some states will have it and others won't. And right. if you right. and if you live in a state where it's illegal, then you just go to a state where it's legal. So you know the California abortion business is going to boom, you know because you know that, that California is not going to make it illegal anytime right. soon. You know right. it, it, we barely restrain them from making it required for everybody. So, right. <laughs> so that's the um, that's the situation there. So the um, yeah, so you you just this is not something that admits of a too simple answer, and that. I think in, in that respect, I think that the new pro-life movement is wise. Let's go to the next one and see what we think. Okay. Next pillar here? Yeah, next pillar. Okay. Hopefully next we'll get through all of them. And if, and yeah, if not, we'll you, know, you can give them a site. Where they oh, well, you know by. what? I, the pillars are changing. Our pillars are constantly changing. Um, uh, so anyway, if we don't get through me. them all, it's not a big deal. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, our next, our next one has to do with women's rights and justice. And I... It was really important to me that we put this second on the list because so many pro-life movements and spokespersons really seem to kind of neglect the importance of women's agency and they deny reproductive rights 
they say well, there's no such thing as reproductive rights. And I'm like, whoa, that's scary. Um, that's like Handmaid's Tale right there. You can believe in reproductive rights and still be pro-life. So, yeah, we say women's bodies and choices are at the heart of the abortion debate, so we would be remiss as a movement to ignore their rights and needs. We feel there is too much time spent arguing with the social and political figures who support abortion and not nearly enough time spent helping the women who actually have them. The applicable efforts we listed above are not just for reducing abortion, but for ensuring justice for women in our society. Furthermore, the pervasive sexual harassment, violence, and prejudice against women are pro-life issues themselves, and we support every effort to put an end to these injustices. We are committed to the protection of women's rights and equality, the advance of equal representation under the law, and respect for women in all areas of our culture. So there's number two. Well, that's a, that, you know, I, I'm amazed that that's just not, that, that that's something that you have to say. I mean, that just seems like common sense, doesn't it? I mean, you'd think. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, the thing that strikes me about the abortion thing is is that, um, and you know, you tell me if I'm off base here. You know, I don't know, but if when. Um, one thing I hear in connection with this debate is the word patriarchy comes up. Mm-hmm. It says, you know, yep. well, you're supporting the patriarchy if you oppose abortion. And I say to myself, you know, abortion has been with, and sometimes to them, uh, abortion has been with us for centuries. You know, yep. back in the Roman Empire, they talked about yep. it. Not what, uh, and and uh, are you saying that the patriarchy didn't obtain back then? I mean, this is, uh, how can... Uh, if anything, and I, I remember reading a translation of a letter that somebody wrote, and this was in the Roman Empire, telling mm-hmm. a woman to get rid of a baby if it turned out to be female. Well, this was that was right. abortion directly; that was exposure. But you know, same difference, right? And uh, except that abortion is more intrusive, mm-hmm. and and uh, you know, but and here, but the husband was directing it. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. And so, so I, you know, um, I don't know. Can, does it, can you address that at all? Because yeah. I guess my this thoughts on a... that aren't, aren't as developed as I'd hoped they'd be when I started talking about that. But it's, it, it, it strikes me that it, in some ways you can talk about abortion itself as being a creature of patriarchy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think um, the other pro-life feminist groups tend to make that point more than we do. Um, And the reason I am um, a little up in the air on that is that I totally, first of all, I totally agree that um, throughout history, abortion has often been something that was forced on women precisely either because of patriarchal uh, power structures or directly by male authority figures. But I also want to emphasize the reality of biology, and this is something that feminists have brought up and a lot of people don't want to to look at, but this the reality of biology is that women bear the this enormous responsibility for reproduction. And it's not something a man can can have sex, uh, whether it's just a one night stand, whether it's an assault, whether it's an actual loving relationship, but he can then walk away. The results of that act, uh, if if a woman conceives, are with a woman for the rest of her life. And so, I feel like we need to put more effort into recognizing just how much that changes us as women and how difficult it can be. And so women seeking abortions are not just doing so because the patriarchy makes them. They're doing so because pregnancy is hard. Childbearing is hard. When you have children and let's say you're suffering from postpartum depression or you, you have difficult pregnancies, Uh, Look at all of the women in the past who used to die in childbirth or die after childbirth uh, of what was then called childbed fever. Uh, And if you look at even today, the especially maternal mortality rate in uh, women in black communities is incredibly high. And so I think that something needs to be done to, uh, to help women with these biological 
burdens that we carry. And, and a lot of women will say, oh, well, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. But when you're like suffering from postpartum depression and having suicidal ideation, it's not beautiful. And a woman who's experienced that may be terrified of returning to the prospect of pregnancy. So I think, yeah, there's a, an element of patriarchy there, but there's also an element in that um, pregnancy is hard and childbearing is hard and women have historically turned to abortions for those reasons as well as for the reason that, you know, your husband is making you, your father is making you, you're going to be chased out of the community if you're found to be pregnant, um, you'll be kicked out of college if you're found to be pregnant. That can still happen if you're at a Catholic college. It's great. Um, so, yeah, I would agree with you to some extent, but I do think that there are more factors involved than that. No, I that, that you've actually made that point in a way that is – never been made clear to me before. I think that that is, I think that's an excellent point of view, and I think that really goes back to the, uh, I was going to say the medical piece or the, mm. the part where, you know, people have access to health care yes, in, in the United States, and, and if in, in, in this case we're talking particularly women, and if they don't have access to the prenatal care that they need and the uh, all the medical stuff that could come up both before and after, um, this is, you know, that you're encouraging abortion when you, when you don't deal with it. And that's oh, yeah. where, that's where the American right wing, and I put quotes around all that right wing, left wing stuff because, uh-huh. you know, but you know, the, the, the American right wing just completely misses the boat on that. And I don't understand that unless, you know, maybe they're using abortion as more of a tool to get you to vote for, um, you know, lowering the taxes of rich people. That might be the case, but... Oh, I think it might be, yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, it, but but if you're really concerned about abortion, and, and I am, I think that, and, and, I, and I can tell that you certainly are, uh, it, it seems to me that you have to actually deal with the kinds of things that incentivize it. And you just uh, enunciated something that, Really, I frankly haven't given enough thought to until this very moment. So, see, you've been uh, instructional. <laughs> this is a watershed moment for me. It's, um, <laughs> you know, because I tend to look at the, the things in the, you know, the economic sense. And I've, mm. I've, for a while, I, you know, to the extent I get anything, you know, but, you know, ordering a pizza is complicated for me. But when I, um, when I uh, uh, sense that, you know, ec- economic circumstances uh, incentivize it, that is, to a certain, you know, to whatever extent it's been playing oh, yeah. now, so now, up, up till now. But um, uh, that's a part that, yeah, really needs more attention, I think, uh, because uh, just the biological event of being pregnant uh, can itself be a, a trauma. And, oh, gosh, yeah. And, yeah. and needs to be, and needs to be addressed uh, in that respect, so and, and and that all just becomes compounded when there's when there's an economic component to it as well. Right. Yeah, there's a real intersection of the the physical reality, the biological reality, with the economic reality, and that's uh, I think like we the new pro life movement maybe perhaps tends to overstress these the dire situations of you know the the woman who is um, you know working two jobs, already has children, husband has left her, finds out she's pregnant, she's desperate. Oh, we look at this as kind of a um, a case study for abortion in dire circumstances, and a lot of the statistics back this up. But there's also the statistics pertaining to all right. So I'll give the example of my situation in which I am a lower middle class working woman. I work, my husband works. Uh, We have three children. We don't have health insurance. We can't afford health insurance. Um, So I, you know, practice NFP uh, like a good little Catholic. But I also, I think about the many women in my situation who, for whom NFP doesn't work. how many women in this situation, if they were to get pregnant, if I were to get pregnant, I would be looking at getting mired in medical bills, especially at my age uh, and with having had 
one um, high risk pregnancy in the past, you know, it, we're, so we're looking at a situation where a woman who seems to be in fairly comfortable circumstances could be one pregnancy away from, you know, uh, moving from that into a, a really dire financial crisis for the family. And there's this tendency to talk about, you know, the beauty of sacrifice. But um, I think that's actually kind of sadistic. <laughs> there's no, it's it's wrong for a woman to be in a situation where there would be this terrible fear of pregnancy as being this thing that would destroy her family's livelihood, uh, destroy well, you know, the, you know. Yeah, that's kind yeah, of the converse of, of uh, you know, when people say, judge not that you be not judged. Well, they're right. quoting Jesus, but they're usually telling you not to judge them. You know? and, right, <laughs> right. And, and, when, yes. and when something like this comes, someone talks about the beauty of sacrifice, they're talking about how beautiful it is when somebody else makes a sacrifice. Exactly, when, when, yeah. When, when, when uh, uh, but these things are supposed to be applied to ourselves. I'm not right. supposed to judge others, you know. I'm supposed right. to make sacrifices. This isn't something I'm supposed to direct someone else to do. That's, these are, yeah. You know, they, yeah. they, 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 this little uh, rhetorical sleight of hand that comes with these things are uh, something to watch from time to time. I'm sorry, but yeah, I, yeah, we. Uh, uh, it, it is for us when it comes to other people's sacrifices and when it comes to what other people are going through, it is for us to be compassionate, not right. tell them to sacrifice. We, yeah. We're supposed to, I'm supposed to sacrifice, not not others. Not, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the way it's, uh, I think, anyway, as best as I can uh, converge uh, random uh, thoughts into a concept but this this is uh well let's read the third one i think we've got some time for a little bit more yeah so our third one is uh euthanasia uh so you know we're we're being classical there abortion euthanasia uh this one i i personally would probably say a lot more about um but and and especially with these cases of suicide that have been in the news lately and Oh, this conversation that's been going on. So we write that uh, while completely rejecting the idea of suicide as a viable option and supporting every effort to prevent it, we understand that there is no realistic legal course of action to stop people from taking their own lives, especially those in a great state of suffering. That said, we fear that by legalizing euthanasia, we create a world that puts the elderly and terminally ill at risk. We also cannot encourage a society that supports the right to die and not the right to live. So there's our, our kind of short phrasing of the matter. No, that's uh, well, that's that's consistent life, right? I mean, uh, you know, the the arguments in favor of it are all utilitarian, okay? Mm-hmm. And and see, that's the I think when it comes to arguments like this, when it comes to pro life stuff generally, I think um, Catholicism comes out of a natural law perspective, right. whereas. Whereas all of the political debate in the United States presumes utilitarianism, and, yeah, I, I, and, yeah. I, and this is what uh, this, of course, comes after the Declaration of Independence, because mm-hmm. Jeremy Bentham uh, criticized the Declaration of Independence just because of its natural law. Oh right, thinking. yeah, yeah. Okay, but um, uh, but everything that enters into public discourse starts out with a utilitarian underpinning. Mm -hmm. In other words, so, yeah, when you talk about something like euthanasia, if the person wants it, then why not? Because he wants it, and that's that's his or her good that they want. But, but, uh, and, and, and the idea that there is a good, that that freedom is the freedom to attain the good is just something that, uh, it goes right over people's heads, right? And so that's that's why that's a tough one, because you know it, it, because of the fact that it presumes a good that is objective and beyond what is pleasant and desirable for us, and that's yeah. That, that's that, that, so that is the uh, I think the basic thing there. So yeah, some people you know they they want to die because of various uh, uh, you know depression or, or, you know, they've got a, a wretched disease and so on. And, 
you know, and it's it's easy to be compassionate towards that, and one should be. But uh, and and of course, when it comes to the law, I mean, you can't punish the person who kills himself. Right. <laughs> Right, um, <laughs> and you shouldn't. That's, you know, that's horrible. Well, yeah. well, you know, I what, what are you going to do? I mean, you know, if uh, so, uh, so that particular question is out of it. So, really, when in a certain sense, unless you're really talking about you know doctors that assist it or what have you, you're really mm-hmm. talking about something that stays pretty much within the moral realm. But it's, uh, uh, but the. But the fact that utilitarianism reigns in terms of questions like that, uh, it, it it means that we as a society, that and coupled with the fact that we've got some kind of superstition against universal health care, mm-hmm. uh, uh, it uh, it makes uh, a situa- it makes it so that we don't address things that lead to that, and right. that's I, I I don't know what do you think of that. Yeah, I think, um, again, this is one of these cases where I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the people who make pro-euthanasia arguments. Um, But I would make, I feel like there's a a strict line to be drawn between one euthanasia camp that seems to just have decided that a lot of people are expendable, and these are the, the, the eugenic people. And these people freak me out, and they're the ones who... Well, are going shit. to want to to take away health care and, and assistance precisely so that they can enact social Darwinism and have these undesirables weeded out. They don't want these people leeching on the system. Uh, and that's why I think that um, legalized euthanasia would be so incredibly dangerous. Um, that and the pressure put on the individual to say, oh, I, I'm worthless I'm a leech on the system. I have no value. But I think that other people who support it are doing so because they legitimately see that extreme suffering is evil. And I feel like that's something we, uh, that actually ties in with my earlier point where people say, oh, well, your sacrifice is beautiful. Oh, you know, this. look at this person dying of cancer. That's so beautiful. And I'm like, no, that's really not beautiful. Well, no, you know, I, I, I think that we do. Yes, I, I don't think that we should uh, use uh, suffering as 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 being a good in, so, in certain no. circumstances as a way of denying compassion to people. But on the other hand, uh, I don't uh, I don't think that we should completely cave to the idea that that uh, pain is is evil. In other words, it's, it's an equivocation. All right, it's like some people say, well, war is evil or pleasure is mm-hmm. good. No, we have different words for these things because they are different things, and you know. So, you know, we we we've got to have we've got to have the rhetoric underlying it, even though what we're saying doesn't necessarily uh, instantiate itself in social policy. Does that make any yeah. sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, although well, I will say that I do actually think that pain is fundamentally evil. I just think that it's not. It's it's not per se the greatest evil and that's why it's legitimate to uh, inflict pain for the sake of a higher good. So, uh, you know, if a a person who's going through cancer treatment experiences extreme pain, but uh, the extreme pain is legitimate because it's part of a, a healing process. It's better than dying of cancer, but that doesn't make the pain itself good. Um, and I think that pleasure also is, is fundamentally good. Like all other things being equal, if you have the chance to be experiencing pleasure versus not experiencing pleasure, you've got a, an objectively better situation. Oh, now I, this, this uh, position of mine is, um, has caused actually a lot of controversy in, in conversations with my fellow Catholics. I think mm-hmm. there's a, a, a tendency which even goes back to pre-Christian times to view pleasure with suspicion and to regard pain with this kind of like stoic admiration. Oh, and I mean, I, I'm into fitness. I realize, you know, you work through the pain, it feels good. Oh, but what you're really emphasizing there is not so much the pain. It's not the pain itself that feels good. It's that, it's that you've worked out. It's the feeling strong, the feeling that you've accomplished something. But, you know, I'm in perhaps a a minority here. (laughs) 
Well, I, I know. I noticed that you just uh, in this conversation. I mean, there's just a whole array of things, uh, topics that we could go off on in terms of the, yeah. <laughs> uh, the discussion here. I mean, you're you're pretty much a Renaissance person here. In ter- you're not just a one issue person at all, are you? So um, I'm a person who talks too much. Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 actually not. You know, talking too much <laughs> happens when you say things and you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I like do I that do. too. <laughs> There's, um, well, you know, we're 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 getting to we're getting close. To oh yeah, time. we're gonna have to. Do you want me to just quickly but, read off our other pillars real quick? No, I want you to. Uh, first of all, I want you to tell <laughs> me about NPLM's uh, view on capital punishment. Oh yeah, we're against it. Um, <laughs> we we we're totally opposed to the death penalty in all cases. Absolutely, uh, we think that it's unjust and ineffective. Well, that's pretty much it. Eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, well, you know, I, I think the thing is that no matter what somebody has done, uh, every human being is created in the image of God and is an end in himself or herself. And yeah, that, you know, I, uh, once when I, uh, I don't know if I was asked to encapsulate Catholic social teaching, but I, that was what I, that was what I said, and that is, is that when we look to uh, Catholic social teaching, uh, the guide, when we don't know the direct answer or the direct answer hasn't been provided, just consider that every single human being is an end in himself or herself, as if the entire world was created for that person. Yeah. And that's the that's how you have to look at it and yeah that includes people on death row who mm-hmm. shouldn't be on death row right <laughs> yes. because because of that very reason yeah um i think that's uh you know who who would jesus execute right right uh, <laughs> you know that's always another good one that's a that's a better way of doing it but yeah so basically you know the, the uh, new pro-life movement is is uh basically a consistent life organization in every sense of that. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, you could uh, give a website or something so that people can uh, go see the rest of the pillars and, uh, and, and the pillars, what they're going to be when they change and right. <laughs> all that, and maybe, you know. Uh, um, but, honestly, the best bet is to follow our Facebook page because that's where uh, the most stuff is going on, New Pro-Life Movement on Facebook. Um we have a, a medium page, but I, it's seriously in need of updating because we still haven't updated. Gosh, what I was reading from was what I'd put together for a consistent life conference I went to last October. Mm-hmm. And since then, um, I've wanted to update our pillars to deal with uh, issues of racial justice and issues of immigration justice. Oh, I guess I'd better get on the ball and do that. <laughs> well, and, and quickly, uh, what, other, what else stuff you got going on? I know you've got this convivium school. Oh, yeah. yeah. Correctly. All right. um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, for those who are um, more interested in art than in activism, um, I should mention, uh, as, other than working for Pathos Catholic, I also work for Revolution of Tenderness, and we do cultural festivals, and uh, one of the big themes in our cultural festivals recently has been uh, migrants, immigrants, and refugees, and we've got one coming up in Pittsburgh uh, late September, so look us up, Revolution of Tenderness, Festival of Friendship, and then we have Convivium Gathering, which is a literary gathering in Pittsburgh in November, and it's going to be fun so uh literary people come to that if you're all if you're if you're into the literature stuff you know go in yeah. there you know and i i can't go because i have i have to look up everything they talk about on you know on fate on wikipedia so oh but, no you should come anyway because it's yeah. for everyone we want <laughs> we want it to be for everyone oh uh, even uh, people who aren't like literary folks yeah um and let's see what else. Well, I, gosh, thanks for coming, Rebecca. Really, this has been uh, fantastic. I hope you'll come back because you've mentioned a lot of things that that would be very interesting to hear your views about. Um, because uh, you know, I, it's uh, yeah, you're yeah, you're you're a thinker. Hey, you know. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I'd love to come back, yeah. Which, which, which rhymes with what other people call it, what other people call me. <laughs> um, people um, call so me that, we'll too. Be, we'll, we'll be back uh, next week, uh, uh, hopefully with a guest as good as this one. Uh, you also can usually hear me on the open door, as I'm on, I'm on the panel of that, uh, which is on uh, comes up at 11 a.m. Eastern on Fridays. And uh, read Rebecca's article on Patheos, Catholic blog, uh, suspended in her jar. Read mine, uh, which is also called Christian Democracy. And uh, that's uh, just type in, I can never remember the website, but that's what you, you just go to Pathios and type yeah, in the names. Yeah, and uh, you'll get there. So, anyway, I appreciate everybody listening in, and uh, you have a pleasant evening and good night. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.